Well, welcome to chapel again. Uh, we welcome you to the space on a day in which it looks like the sun will break out of the clouds. So we're giving God thanks for that. As you came in, uh, you should have received a postcard and this will be your guide for the next couple weeks, starting next week. It uh, uh, highlights some events that are coming up for Holy Week as well as Resurrection Week. So uh, please take note of those things. And if you feel like uh, you'd like to take a few of the few of these postcards with you to give to other people, please feel free to do so. They're available in the back. Um, on the postcard, you'll see that for Holy Week, uh, chapel next week is uh, themed the journey to the cross. And while it says we're meeting here, we're actually going to meet uh, on Tiffany Loop, where uh, we will be taking the journey of the cross through a traditional uh, stations of the cross kind of exhibit that many of our Catholic sisters and brothers are familiar with. Father Jordan from the Newman Center will be guiding our time, and again, we will be meeting in Tiffany Loop, weather permitting. Yes, once again, chapel will be out in Tiffany Loop, and we will be journeying through the Stations of the Cross. Uh, it'll be set up around the loop, and uh, the plan is for it to be up all week so that you can engage it as often as you like. So again, next week, chapel in the loop. Now, if it's raining and we don't have it there and you don't see anyone there, we'll be in here, okay? But the plan is to be up there. Uh, we are continuing in our series, The Fruitful Life, and this morning I have the pleasure of uh, introducing the Reverend Derek Harris. Uh, Reverend Derek Harris is a Seattle native and an ordained minister of the gospel with an enveloped passion towards education, holistic discipleship, and community development. The commitment is evident from his 13 years of experience working with students in the foster care system, pastoring with an underrepresented, in underrepresented contexts, working with special needs communities, empowering low-earning families to gain economic freedom, and local community advocacy around racial reconciliation, systemic injustice, and healthy living. Reverend Harris earned his Bachelor's of Arts from Northwest University <coughs> and his Master's of Divinity from Princeton Theological Seminary. And uh, you may know him as the Director of the Seminary Administration at Seattle Pacific University and uh, the Director of Discipleship at New Beginnings Christian Fellowship. Reverend Harris not only believes he can make positive contribution in the lives of others, he believes he has a spiritual and moral obligation to do so. He believes this is an appropriate response to the grace that God has bestowed on him. And as someone that knows him, I surely do believe that God has graced him with much. So we look forward to hearing from Reverend Derek Harris. Good morning. Good morning to each of you. Um, I'm going to jump right in with a quick word of prayer. Gracious God, we do thank you for this day. The day that you've made, the day that you brought us to. Lord, we pray that in this day we can see you moving, dwelling amongst us, between us, with us. We pray that during this time together, we come to learn more about you, more about ourselves, and more about what you would have us to do in this world. In the name of Christ Jesus, we do pray. Amen. Amen. Go on and stand with me, if you will, just really quickly from, uh, and I'm going to be reading the scriptures. This, this is what we do in the Baptist church. We, we actually don't call it church. We call it church. Um, but we're going to look at Matthew uh, chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. It reads as follows. Then Peter came to Jesus and said, Lord, how many times shall I forgive my brother or sister who sins against me? Up to seven times? And Jesus answered, I tell you, not seven times, but 77 times. You may be seated. If I had a title, uh, this quick homily, if you will, I will call it, but who's counting? But who's counting? You know, I was told that I only have 20 minutes here, but who's <laughs> counting? Right, right. Who is, who is counting? Um, if you're anything like me, you have a tendency to keep score. You have a tendency to, to count. Matter of fact, me and, me and my wife finished our taxes not too long ago. And the only reason why we did that was because the IRS 
It's counting, right? Right. Somebody's keeping, keeping score. You know. Well, here we have a glimpse into, um, into a particular story, into a particular lens, into the life of one of Jesus' disciples by the name of Peter. And Peter presents this great, this profound question that I believe at one point or another, many of us has, have asked, are asking, will ask, how many times? How many times? And, and in particular, we see that Peter is talking around the topic of forgiveness. And that's what I want to do on this day. I want to, us to give it a kind of a clearer and closer a lean into this conversation of forgiveness. Forgiveness. But here's the thing. I want to do it a little bit different. I want to take it from a little different vantage point. Oftentimes when we have conversations on forgiveness, it's very quickly to then individually and immediately move into then how do we practice this, right? How do we live this out? What's the next step? What's the one, two, three? What's the A, what's the ABC? What's the QR elemental, right? No one says that, but I thought I'd throw that in there, um, right? And, and, so, and so I think we actually have to take a step back. If we really want to see what God is up to, what God might be inviting us to, how God might be encouraging us to journey towards this authentic Christian witness. So here it is. The other day I was sitting in my office and it came to me that forgiveness is a lot like currency. What do I mean? Forgiveness is a lot like currency. All of us need it, right? All of us maybe want more of it. But at the end of the day, we struggle when it comes to giving it up. Forgiveness right? It's a lot like currency. And I, think, and I think the reason why we struggle is because we understand that forgiveness is costly. It is expensive. It is a costly exchange. And if we're transparent with one another, I believe that we would all agree that forgiveness is costly. We have a challenge. We are challenged with offering it up to someone so freely. You see, I've come to realize that forgiveness isn't something you accidentally do. No one wakes up and says that they accidentally forgave the person that wronged them. No one says, oh, oh I'm still mad at you. Oh, I forgot. I forgot about that. Right. No one wakes up and says that they accidentally have forgiven anyone. Forgiveness is expensive. It's weighty. It's costly. And so that makes us approach it very differently. We understand that forgiveness isn't like some cheap perfume that we douse all over ourselves that, you know, permeates the pew when you're in your church. That's just my church, right? Okay, uh, right, uh, right, right. But forgiveness is an expensive aroma. It has notes of cherry, of oaks, herbs, and vanilla extracts. It's applied with care. It's not thrown about like economy luggage on a conveyor belt. You see, for, forgiveness, it is the value. It is the value that forgiveness carries that makes it so much harder for us to give it up so freely. Now, here's the thing. I think there's two, re two ways that forgiveness is costly. On the one hand, I would say that for, forgiveness is costly and it is challenging because we feel that sometimes when we offer forgiveness, the weight and the value of it exceeds what the other person can afford. And that makes it hard to really give it up. It's, it's costly, it's expensive. And we feel that this expensive thing does not belong out there with the trash and those people that talk about us, and those people that let us go, and those people that get on, on their nerves, this is expensive. This is, this is, these are red bottoms. That was a Cardi B reference for everybody under 25, <laughs> right? Um, right? We understand that uh, forgiveness is costly on the one hand because we feel that if we were to give it up so, so freely, somehow it seems to trivialize, to downsize, and to fantasize a true injury that we experience. Right? But then on the other hand, I would say that forgiveness is costly because not from, well, forgiveness isn't costly on the other side because of our own injury, our own previous injuries, our own previous hurts, heart, heartaches, and our own previous hangups. In the other times that we forgave those people that have wronged us, and we now feel that we actually don't have enough, enough forgiveness forgiveness left. And so we don't want to freely give it up to, to, you know, someone because if I get hurt one more time, I don't know how I'm going to recover. If I get a low blow one more time, I don't know how I'm going to bounce back. 
If I find myself in emotional collapse, I don't know how I'm going to recover from all of this. And we understand that forgiveness is, it is costly. You see, on the one hand, on the first hand, forgiveness is costly because we don't feel that it's equal to the offense that, it, that we might have experienced. And on the other hand, forgiveness is costly because our previous experience, those that uh, happened before our present in injustice or injury, may have caused us to believe that we can afford the possibility of being hurt again. And at those times, we feel that our forgiveness res- reservoir has limited resources, insufficient funds. Let me give you a clear example of someone that might be on that other side. You see, someone on that other side where they feel that they don't have the, uh, enough resources, where they might come back as insufficient funds, they may say things like, I will never trust anyone the way that I trusted them again. Anybody ever been there? Anybody ever said, I will never allow myself to get that close to someone the way I did them again. I will never share the sensitive secrets or emotional experience, my fears, my aspirations again because they just take me for granted and they walk all over me and they use them at inappropriate times. But here's the thing. I think we also got to give Peter credit. I think we've got to pause here and take another step back and give Peter credit. You see, Peter asks this question. He says, how many times? How many times do I forgive someone that wrongs me? How many times do I say, how many times do I open myself up? How, how many times? And I've got to pause here parenthetically and make it strongly clear that if you're asking that question, I want you to stop beating yourself up because you actually do have a place of hope. That is a place of hope because you could have easily been on that place where you said never, never, never again. You, 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 see, you see, the fact that Peter is still asking this question actually shows that Peter is still hopeful. Peter is still open to the possibility, open to the possibility of change, open to the possibility of, of, of figuring this thing out. But if you're on the other side and you're saying never again, we've got to be careful. And I pray for the individuals that make those type of declarations. You see, on the, on the surface, individuals that make these type of declarations, they often do so with the intent of self-preservation, right? Self-assertion, to speak from a posture of inward strength and resilience, when in reality, these types of responses are just the opposite. What are they really? Well, they're this. They are nothing but outward responses of an interior fear. An interior fear that they are too damaged, too hurt, too wounded to ever be able to recover from another disappointment, another sabotage, another attack on their character. People at this point haven't fully recovered from their past. And I got to be honest, I'm still working on some of these things too. But instead, what they've done is that they've then declared emotional bankruptcy. And they're steps away from foreclosing on their own happiness. What do I mean? You see, the person in the second instant actually feels that they're unable to withstand another letdown, another injury, another low blow, another injustice, another death, another social or emotional concern. And as a result, they've developed, you've developed, I've developed, possibly our family, our friends or peers have developed a rule of life that has unknowingly concretized our own injury and has subsequently obstructed our healing process. You see, so many of us go through life trying to avoid ever being hurt again, that we miss out on the opportunities that God gives us to heal. You see, forgiveness is not just merely about those that have wronged you, but it's also about you being able to hope again, to live again into love again. And I've come to realize that that health is not simply the absence of injury, but health is actually the presence of full life. Health is not just the absence of injury, but it's the presence of a full life. And you can't have a full and healthy life if you've never opened yourself up to the possibilities of today because you're stuck circling and cycling on the injuries of the past. I want you to live a healthy life. God wants you to live a healthy life, a full life. Now, what I'm not saying is that we aren't supposed to learn from our mistakes or from our hurt and from our harms. 
I'm not su- su- suggesting that we're just supposed to let everything go and we're just supposed to move on as though it never happened. And I'm not saying that we aren't supposed to seek justice or a reconciliation or even reparations or that some injuries do require consequence. After all, the scriptures say be innocent as doves and as wise as serpents. So we're supposed to use discernment and wisdom here. But here's what I am saying. It's just like the tree that withers and the flower that fades every winter and rises in splendor in all brilliance each spring. So too must we rise from the nights of the wounded soul and spring forth with revitalized outlook and a renewed hope. We must rise from every downfall, from every low blow, from every collapse with a renewed mind and a renewed spirit, a renewed commitment to compassion and a renewed commitment to grace, a renewed commitment to mercy and to love. You see, God has called the body of Christ to go beyond our natural tendencies. Our natural tendencies of envy, of jealousy, of malice, of hatred, of hurt, of harm. But God is calling us to tap into the tendencies of God. Tap into the tendencies of God. You know those tendencies. The ones that are largely echoed throughout the the Gospels. The ones in where I can see where in the Gospel of Matthew where, uh, where Jesus says, You have heard it said, but I say to you. Matthew 5, Jesus says, you have heard it said, you shall not murder. But I say to you, you should be watchful even about your anger. Matthew 5 and 27 says, you have heard it said that you should not commit adultery. But I say to you, do not look with lust for you already committed adultery of the heart. Matthew 5 and 33, which says, you have heard it said, do not break a promise. But I say to you, do not make an oath at all. The tendencies of God, where where Jesus says, you have heard it said, an eye for an eye, and even a tooth for a tooth, but I tell you, do not resist evil, and turn the other cheek. In Matthew 43 and 44, you have heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say, love your enemy, and pray for those who persecute you. You see, Jesus aims to recalibrate our thinking. Jesus aims to alter our intuitions and to reform our instincts. Jesus is calling the people of God to live beyond the boundaries of our biological condition. Jesus is calling the body of Christ to not give in to our natural tendencies, but to give in to the tendencies of God, the tendencies in the the tendencies of God's character. Where there is hate, we are called to to love. Where there is envy, we are called to celebration. Where there is deception, we are called to choose truth and honesty. And where there is hostility, we are called to choose compassion. Where there's arrogance, oh, we're called to humility. And where there's selfishness, we are called to community. And where there's a stranger, oh, where there, oh, 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 where there's a stranger, we are called to create friendship. And where there's bitterness, we are called to choose forgiveness. Jesus is calling the church, the people of God, to recalibrate our thinking. You know, it's interesting um, that not too long ago, uh, in the ninth, well, okay, maybe for those that still are under 25, um, but, but once upon a time in the 1990s, I know some of us were born then, but once upon a time in the 1990s, a small number of economists have suggested that consumers could be persuaded to gradually shift to electric cars. But here's the only way that it could happen is if they were to impose regulatory requirements and also generate some type of social uh, change, uh, some social, if you will, stigma around driving a big H2 Hummer. Uh, There may be some folks with H2 Hummers. um, And that's kind of, I guess, that's that's just a slam at you. That's all that is. Um, But... Economists discovered that if, that if they could start with the upper middle class and, be, and begin to shift the social norms around the environment, that then, that, that then over time, people would eventually move into being able to, um, to transition into possibly driving electric cars and that it could catch on, that it could truly, truly catch on. And at some point, driving uh, fuel-saving cars like the D- Toyota Prius, some of you have have Priuses. Uh-huh. Let me see a show of hands. I just, I just want to make sure I'm not making fun of the right person. Okay, there we are. 
good. <laughs> yep. All right. So um, I apologize for every, on behalf of every P P Prius driver. Um, I don't actually drive one, but I do know your, your pain, especially as you're trying to merge onto the freeway. Um, so, but, but essentially what I'm, what I'm getting at here is that, uh, is that at one point, it was thought that no one would ever transition into electric cars. But over time, the, imagine, the unimaginable became imaginable. A recalibration of our thinking, a recalibration of our intuition, which is the same thing that we see within the life and ministry of Christ. There's a recalibration. I don't know if you've heard the, the you know, story, um, but, but there's a story of a professor, of a professor at a local uni university. They were actually teaching, right? And as they were teaching, uh, the professor held up a bottle of water and he asked the class, how much do you think this weighs? The student in the front was a math major. He said, well, given the width, the circumference, the average, you know, about, about 16 ounces. Student in, in, in the back, halfway fallen asleep, raises their hand, and, they, and the professor calls on them. And it turns out this is a philosophy major. And so he says, you know, it's actually, you know, the bottle's not even real. <laughs> We're not even here. <laughs> That's actually a bad question. <laughs> But then there's someone that's, um, that's like more sort towards the, uh, you know, the middle of the uh, classroom, and they raise their hand. And she says, uh, well, well, can I hold it? The professor says, oh, sure. So she comes on up, she picks up the bottle, and, she, and then she says, ah, 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 but wait, says the prof, you have to be willing to hold this for the entire duration of my lecture. She says, okay, sure. So the professor begins to teach and teach. 45 minutes go by, 50 minutes go by. It's one of those longer, intensive courses. You know, hour goes by. And you see her arms slowly rise and fall and rise and fall and fall and rise, right? You see it just slowly begin to do this thing again and again. And then what happens is, is that the lecture is over and the, and, the, and, the, uh, and, and the prof says, great, all right, class dismissed. And she says, wait, 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 wait. I've been holding this bottle for the last 45 minutes, 50 minutes, an hour and a half. I think, I've, I think I've figured out what your whole point was. And, she says, and, the, and the professor says, okay, great. Well, how much does the bottle weigh? And here's what she discovered. is that it was never really about how much the bottle weighed. But it was always about how long, how long you carry it. And when we're talking about forgiveness, the same thing is true in our own lives. It's not so much about how often somebody hurts you. It's not so much ab ab about uh, how large and big those blows are. And believe me, I hear you. I understand that, that that's real, that trauma is, is, is real. But here we see that the teaching is, it's about how long you're willing to hold on to it, how long you're willing to, to hang on to resentment, how long are you willing to hold on to bitterness, how long are you willing to hang on to envy? How long are you willing to, to, to grip and grasp letdowns and disappointments? Because at the end of the day, we can always put some things down and put them in the proper hands. And those hands that I'm talking about, are they everlasting, ever open, ever wide? Hands of God. Let's pray. God, we do thank you for this time, this time of where we have, have had the chance to, to listen to what your spirit uh, would reveal to us. Lord, we pray uh, that we are able to look into our own lives, to reflect on those places, uh, those places and spaces of where we ask the similar questions that Peter has asked. How long? How, how many times? Should we for, forgive? And again and again, you've reminded us that the answer is always more. So help us to forgive more, to love more, to walk in humility more, to tap into your tendencies more, and to live out an authentic Christian witness that you are calling us towards. 
in our lives, in this world. In the name of Christ Jesus, amen. Thanks, Derek. You know, so often we um, like rush out of here to the next thing. And so we do have a few minutes. And so what I would like to actually invite us to do is just take a couple of moments just to reflect in silence. Um, I don't know what came up for you. I actually had a particular relationship that came into mind for me, um, one that God, I think, has been continuing to ask me to um, move a little bit closer to holding my hands open to God. Um, Being in the season of Lent, I keep hearing my theology play in my head. You forgive because Christ forgave you. You love because God loves you. But then there's still this angst in my soul. And so, and I think it does come from the places of hurt and anguish that Um, that Derek talked about because we make these rules in our lives for ourselves when we get hurt to not do something again or I won't let that person get that close to me or I won't be put in a situation where I have to be vulnerable enough to get hurt again and I think that in those places when we make those rules for ourselves to protect ourselves we miss the opportunity to actually experience love like to actually experience God's presence with us And then even the hope of being loved or being able to love somebody else again. And I do think that this rootedness of forgiveness is actually rooted in love. It's so that we can be in a community that is willing to love and to be vulnerable. And so um, I'd like to just give you just a minute or so in silence um, to actually just ask the spirit to probe your heart. Maybe there is a person that you need to forgive Or maybe it's actually that you need to be able to be in a place to receive forgiveness from someone else. And so I'd just like you to take that moment just in silence with God um, to ask the Spirit to reveal your heart to you. And then I'll pray for us. Spirit, I believe that you want us to live a healthy, full, fruitful life that Derek preached about this morning. And so God, as either these people or these relationships have come up in our minds, I know you want to remind us that it's a process, that we are on this journey, and that hurts and wounds often don't go away immediately. And so God, I pray um, that you would move us beyond our natural tendencies, that the places that we are holding on to that may be wounding or sinful places, um, that God, that you would continue to move us towards healing and redemption, that it's not just the how much, but are we willing to stay on that journey in community with one another, even when it's super hard? And so God, um, I believe that, that you're inviting us into this journey of the fruitful life. Sometimes it's to be pruned in different places and sometimes it's abundant fruit. And so God, I pray that you would continue to do that work in us. God, we are just into um, the spring quarter. And so in that, um, we're just doing life together. So I pray that you would give us strength. And I pray that you would give us promptings of you throughout the day, throughout the week, to be mindful of how you are actively working in our lives, moving us to forgiveness or moving us towards a different fruit that you are yielding in our lives. Help us to see you and help us to see one another. And God, would you remind us that we are not alone. I thank you for your redemptive, ever-present work in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So next week, I invite you to join us out in Tiffany Lee... Tiffany Loop, um, as we just journey through the cross, this is, um, there's 14 stations that we will be journeying through together, and I think it's just a great opportunity to slow down, really, and then to actually physically journey with Jesus in the community, and so we invite you to join us for that uh, for chapel next week, Um, so hope you have a great week. Uh, The worship team is going to uh, lead us in a little extended worship, so you're welcome to stay. Otherwise, have a great week.